Known as the movie capital of the world, bringing films to audiences that provide entertainment and at times thought-provoking drama, Hollywood recently hosted a different kind of media through a unique forum broadcast live worldwide on Supreme Master Television on Saturday, July 26, 2008. The Climate Change International Conference was held at the Pacific Design Center in West Hollywood, California, USA. Organized by the Supreme Master Ching Hai International Association, it was a conference that brought together green Hollywood celebrities and notable speakers. Co-hosted by Emmy Award-winning television journalist and vegan Jane Velez Mitchell, the event was informative and the subject matter highly relevant. Three panels were conducted, each with a different theme the urgent scientific facts of the climate crisis, its spiritual perspectives, and the transformational role of the media. Invited as a special guest speaker, Supreme Master Ching Hai graciously attended via live video conference to answer questions from the panelists as well as the audience. We now invite you to join us for the rebroadcast of the Climate Change International Conference. We are so excited today to have with us one of the leaders in this movement. He is the author of the best-selling book, The World Peace Diet, Eating for Spiritual Health and Social Harmony. What a great title. What a great book. And let me introduce now Dr. Will Tuttle. It's great to be here. Uh, as we just heard, I'm Dr. Will Tuttle, and I'm the author of The World Peace Diet, and I've been a vegan for about 28 years, and uh, thank you. About maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I started thinking that someone should write a book that gives not just the environmental implications and the health implications and the implications for animal cruelty to our meals, but actually the bigger picture of what it does to us spiritually and psychologically, the history and anthropology of this whole culture, and the main role that seeing animals merely as commodities plays in our own difficulty in solving our problems. So um, I was uh, thinking that someone would, someone would write a book that would give this big picture, and I was waiting for it to be written, and my, uh, Madeline, my spouse, said, if you want to read that book, I think you would better write it. So uh, I spent five years and wrote the book, and I'm really honored to be here today and be part of this movement, which I believe in my heart is the most powerful movement on this planet for a positive evolution for peace and harmony. And I'd like to uh, take some time now to introduce Supreme Master Ching Hai. When I first saw the videos of Supreme Master Ching Hai back in the 1980s, I was immediately struck by her benevolent presence and her relaxed and profound wisdom. As the years have gone by, my respect for her as a spiritual teacher has grown so much that I see her as one of the most brilliant and inspiring lights shining on this earth today. Whenever I become despairing of humanity's blindness and cruelty, I need only think of Supreme Master Ching Hai and her loving and enthusiastic students and all the work they are selflessly doing to promote compassion and peace. And I know she is inspiring a great movement to raise consciousness here on this planet. When people ask me whose spiritual teachings and example I recommend most highly, it is Supreme Master Ching Hai. To me, she is a living miracle. On the outer physical side, she is a petite Asian woman from an ordinary village. Growing up in Vietnam, she partook of both the Christian and Buddhist traditions and also knew firsthand of the horrors of war. I think that from her childhood, there was a love for all life shining in her like a bright star, always leading her, and she eventually moved to Germany and married a German doctor and worked in social programs there. Her spiritual calling beckoned so strongly, though, that she felt she had to travel to India, and with her husband's loving blessing, she went to the Himalayas seeking an authentic spiritual teacher. She entered many hardships there, but eventually found a great teacher in the remote mountains and through her intense meditation practice, she attained deep insight into the nature of reality. She returned to Eastern Asia with no thought of teaching, but the light of her love and wisdom was irresistible, and she quickly became a magnet for students seeking spiritual inspiration and guidance. As awareness of her teaching and healing presence spread, thousands of people were inspired by her example and spontaneously, meditation centers were formed all over the world 
with both regular meditation sessions as well as community outreach projects to help those in need. As I mentioned in my book, The World Peace Diet, the worldwide followers of Supreme Master Ching Hai have set up vegan restaurants in many cities and contribute vegan clothing, food, shelter, and aid to disaster victims, prisoners, children, and the elderly in countries around the world. Though she requires students to meditate two and a half hours per day, vow to eat no flesh or egg products, refrain from alcohol and non-prescription drugs, and not work in jobs that promote the exploitation of animals or people, her movement continues to spread. Rather than impede her movement, her insistence that her students reduce the cruelty in their meals may paradoxically promote it. People who are serious about spiritual growth are apparently capable of, of embracing fundamental change in their lives and may even welcome the opportunity. I feel everyone on earth owes a debt of gratitude towards Supreme Master Ching Hai and to her students as well. Kindness anywhere blesses everyone everywhere. We are all interconnected. Her efforts to bless the world are magnified by the purity of her intentions, making the efforts of this petite woman absolutely enormous in their impact. People often ask me what the best strategies and methods are to help us be more effective in our advocacy for animals and the earth. Besides educating ourselves about the issues, the most important contribution we can make to the animal liberation movement is to seek authentic spiritual liberation for ourselves and the best way we can help bring peace is to cultivate inner peace. I believe Supreme Master Ching Hai lives to give, to love, to bless others constantly. She never asks people for contributions and in fact she refuses them. Through her amazing creativity she is able to found countless effective relief campaigns to disaster victims all over the globe and provide helpful gifts to children, prisoners, the elderly, and the infirm. She is love in action. Personally, I am often astonished by the sheer creative genius of her jewelry and clothing designs, of her lectures, stories, and jokes, of her paintings, music, and other creations. With the help of her enthusiastic students, she publishes a vast array of books, CDs, DVDs, and magazines in over 30 languages. The TV station that she has inspired is unique in the world, broadcasting 24-7 in 15 languages simultaneously and emphasizing constructive news and the uplifting truth that countless people are working hard in many ways to bring healing, peace, wisdom, and beauty to our world. The hallmark of her teaching is that it is not only spiritual and transcendent, but eminently practical as well. That she has gained so many enthusiastic supporters is a testimony to humanity's essential compassion and courage. It is my great honor to welcome to our gathering the great spiritual beacon whose love and understanding light up this earth for all people, animals, and future generations. Supreme Master Ching Hai. Hello, everyone. Greeting to you. <laughs> and God bless you so much. And I want to say hello, greeting, and thank you to your honorable Chef Prank the mayor of West Hollywood, and all the scientists, professors, media representatives, and all distinguished guests who are present today. Thank you for taking uh, some of your precious time in your busy life to attend this conference, to offer your support, advices, ideas, and blessing. Together, maybe we will still be able to save the planet by working hard to remind people the solutions to global warming. I thank you again, and may God bless you so much for your noble intention. And please continue. I'm just here to listen. Just want to say hello. <laughs> hello. 
Thank you so much, Supreme Master. It is so great to hear from you. And even as I listen to your voice, I can tell that you are love in action. The point is we're getting to hear from Supreme Master and that's crucial. So that's the main thing. And so once again, we are so delighted, Supreme Master, that you are there. Uh, you have done so much uh, personally, every time I have asked for help from Supreme Master for causes, uh, whether it's rescuing the seals or stopping animal cruelty in factory farms, she and her amazing team have always been there with the utmost generosity. It brings tears to my eyes. Uh, and I just think she's an amazing example for all of us. So let's hear it for Supreme Master. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. I'd like to introduce you to a truly remarkable man. He is a cowboy. He's made history exposing the most toxic secrets of agribusiness. Fondly called the Mad Cowboy, Howard Lyman spent his career as one of the largest cattle feed operators in the United States until something happened. And that was a battle with cancer. And it turned him into one of the most vocal vegan activists the world has ever seen. He became world famous after an appearance on Oprah. You probably remember it. It rattled meat markets around the world. And he is going to tell us all about that. Howard, come on and talk to us because you're the man. You're the man who got me to go vegan. I interviewed you 10 years ago. And you asked me if I was a vegan, and I said, I'm just a vegetarian. You said liquid meat, and I never touched dairy from that moment on. Thank you very much, Jane. We're here today. We're approaching the cliff at 200 miles an hour. The politicians and the bureaucrats are talking about not to worry. They're going to give the best care possible to those that survive at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> I'm a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator. I travel around the world and I talk to people about the proper amount of animal products to have in their diet as being zero. What I want to tell you is that I spent 45 years of my life in production agriculture. What we are doing today in America on our farms and ranches is absolutely, totally non-sustainable. We need to change. I was raised during the Second World War. We had the largest organic dairy farm in the state of Montana. My parents couldn't hire any help and my mother and father were milking cows. That meant that I was raised by my grandparents. Back then, there was no such thing as swing slides or Lego blocks. My first job, five years old, was working in the garden. Birds, trees, and living soil. I thought it was the Garden of Eden. The only thing I ever wanted to be was a farmer. I spent the first 12 years of my life doing nothing but partying and playing football because I knew I was going to be a farmer. When I went to that farm or that business to be run, I didn't have the tools to run a business. I was dumber in a post. I didn't let that bother me any. I did what most good red-blooded American youth, 12 years of going to school and not learning anything, I immediately went on to the university. <laughs> I went to the university because I wanted to be an agribusinessman. Now, I couldn't spell it, but I knew that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> I learned a thing about herbicides, pesticides, hormones, and medication. I soaked it up like a sponge. I was going to go home and take that organic farm and turn it into an agribusiness. I graduated with a degree in agriculture, and I went home, and I said to my father, I said, move over, Pop. I'm going to take this one horse business and I'm going to turn it into an agribusiness. And he said, what in the world is that? And I said to him, didn't you ever hear about better living through chemistry? He said, no, our job is to work with nature. I said, that's old fashioned. Our job is to feed a hungry world. I never met a chemical that I didn't like. Herbicides, pesticides, hormones and medication. I took that one horse farm and over a period of years, I turned it into an operation where I had 7,000 head of cattle. 
I can't tell you what a thrill it was the first time I wrote a check for a million dollars and it didn't bounce. <laughs> and I thought, man, I have arrived. I'm the Donald Trump of agriculture. <laughs> but just when I was on top of the world, I got a wake up call. I ended up paralyzed from the waist down. I had a tumor on my spinal cord and the doctor told me, he said, if that tumor is on the inside of the cord, you have less than one chance in a million you will ever walk again. Here I am, waiting for an operation. A lot of things going through my mind. It was not about owning seven combines at $100,000 a piece, or 20 tractors or 30 trucks. What was going through my mind is why I became a farmer. Birds, and trees, and living soil. I saw the birds die, the trees die, I saw the soil change, and it was not until I was paralyzed I was willing to admit I was the problem, not the solution. They operated on me for 12 hours. Cut the bone off of the back of my spinal column. Sure enough, the tumor was on the inside of the cord. They split the covering on the cord. Not only was it on the inside, it was under the cord. They could not lift the cord up to get to the tumor. All they could do was pick a nerve, cut it. They took out a tumor the size of my thumb. I walked out of the hospital with a one in a million operation. But I guarantee you I walked out a much different individual. I knew that it was not about more land or more cattle or more equipment. There was more to it than just being bigger and richer. I went to my banker and I said to him, I said, I need your help. We need to start farming with nature. My banker, he reared back in his chair and he said, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I said, I think we need to become organic farmers. And he looked at me and he said, you want me to lend you money? You're not going to share it with my other customers, the chemical dealer, the pharmaceutical dealer, the fertilizer dealer? He said, there will never be a day like that. And so 1983, I sold my farm, I paid my debts, and I started working with other farmers to start producing food correctly. I learned that there is a lot of money out there that do not want people to know the truth. I started talking to people about not eating animals. Talk to them about mad cow disease. They thought I was the one that had holes in my brain because they'd never heard of it. But I ended up on the Oprah show. I told a few million people that we were grinding up cows and feeding them back to cows. That we were scraping up roadkill, deer, elk, possum, raccoons, and we were feeding those back to cows. And then we were taking euthanized pets, dogs and cats, full of chemicals that were used to kill them. The city of Los Angeles alone, 200 tons of dogs and cats a month are being ground up and put back into the feed for our pets or our food animals. Oprah, her eyes were as big as saucers. She turned around and looked at the guy from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and said, Dr. Weber, are we feeding cows to cows? I will never forget what he had to say. Uh, yo, there's a, <laughs> a limited amount of that going on. Well, the next thing out of Oprah's mouth got us sued. She said, that stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now, I knew that 13 states had a thing called the food disparagement law. But the food disparagement law said it was against the law to say anything you knew to be false. I told the truth. But guess what? The cattlemen sued. They didn't want the people to know the truth. They ended up suing us for six years, hundreds of thousands of dollars defending our right to tell the American people the truth. I want you to realize sitting here today that if we don't deal with the truth, if we don't realize the fact that the majority of Americans today are dying 
from pain inflicted by their fork. We're digging more graves with our fork than any other tool that's out there. We need to look at what's going on in the world. We need to understand that Easter Island, for example, when you have these large stone monuments set up on the beach, at one time was a vibrant society. Rich soil, trees, boats, fish. But in there, your stature was how big a stone monument you put up. Well, there were some stowaways came to the island. Rats. They didn't care because the rats were not eating the human food. They were eating the seeds from the palm trees. As they cut down the trees to sled the large monuments down to the beach, there were fewer and fewer trees because no new trees were growing. Can you imagine what it was like when the last monument cut the last tree and there were never going to be any more trees on Easter Island? The monuments are there today. The people are gone because they could not learn to live within their environment. It's the same thing we're faced with today. We need to understand that the tipping point between everything being fine and total disaster is a very fine line. If we look at St. Matthew's Island, for example, 1943, they put 29 reindeer on an island so they would have a backup food supply for the military detachment that was there. They never needed them. 29 reindeer on a 128 square mile island with no natural predators. 20 years, that 29 island animals went to 6,000 fat, sleek, healthy animals in 20 years. 20 years later, there was not one live animal left on the island because they did not learn to live within the environment that they had. We have the same problem right now. When the boat people came to the United States a little under 300 years ago, we had the deepest, richest topsoil on the face of the earth. In 300 years, we have lost 75% of all of the topsoil that was here. It takes 500 years to produce an inch of topsoil. We haven't been here long enough to produce an inch of topsoil, and we've lost three quarters of what was here. 1850 in Iowa, they built a church. From 1850 in Iowa till today, that church has been in continuous use. In 1850, they took a picture of it. All of the land around the church was farmed. All of it was at the same elevation. Over 150 years later, they took another picture of the same church. All of the land around it was still farmed. The only difference is the church sits 10 feet higher today than all of the farm ground around it. If we are going to survive as a homo sapiens species, we need to understand the fact that 80% of all of the grain that are produced in the United States of America today is stuffed down the throat of an animal. It takes 16 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. 16 pounds of grain you can feed 32 hungry people. Which is the best use of our resources? We need to understand that the future is to feed healthy people, not animals to kill them. I spent 45 years of my life in animal production. I will tell you that what we're doing today is absolutely, totally non-sustainable. I changed from a meat-eating animal production person to a person today that is a vegan, eating nothing with a face, liver, or a mother.
I changed my diet for my health. I do what I do today as a hardcore vegan for the love of the animals. I know that no animal has to die for me to live. If we are going to survive as a species, we have to understand that our job is not to do everything. Our job is to do everything that we can do. And I charge you today with a very simple, straightforward charge. All you have to do is what you can do. Go veg, go green, save the planet. Thank you very much. It's certainly been most informative and educational, and as you can imagine, some of the members in our audience right now have a few questions. Mr. Lyman, you have uh, taken my breath away. Thank you for your love for coming here today to be with us. My name is Betska Kaber. I am co-president of Coaching and Leadership International. We are the global leaders in mind, body, spirit, coach training, and I'm also the president of ecofoodprint.com. I have a very important question for you, and that is, should we put the carbon tax on meat? Woo! And if yes, how do we do that? The first question is, should we put a carbon tax on meat? The answer to that is yes. How do we do that? Remember, I spent five years working on Capitol Hill. I learned a thing that was called the golden rule. Them that got the gold are making the rules. <laughs> the question is, how are we going to do it? It's simple. If you can take a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator, and I can change and become a hardcore vegan, does that mean that the people that care about the environment can't? 79% of Americans claim to be vegetarian. If you're actually going to claim to be a vegetarian, how about walking your talk? If we are going to change this, it is not going to happen 
in Washington, D.C. It's going to happen right here. Look at what has happened in West Hollywood, what they have been able to do in this community. We need to go in our own communities. We have to organize. We have to look at what's not available. And if it's not available, we need to start it. If there are changes that need to happen, we need to be the people that start the change. Our job is to become the leader so that when we look in the eyes of a child, we can basically say to them, I can't do everything, but I can do everything that I can do. And if we don't, there will not be a future for our children and grandchildren. Can we do it? Absolutely. When should we start? Right now. I do what I do today as a hardcore vegan for the love of the animals. I know that no animal has to die for me to live. If we are going to survive as a species, we have to understand that our job is not to do everything. Our job is to do everything that we can do. And I charge you today with a very simple, straightforward, charge. All you have to do is what you can do. Go veg. Go green. Save the planet.